Hello, Booktube. I have a Brattle Bookshop haul for you. <laughs> Let me explain. <laughs> I know that just a couple of days ago, I made a video in which I said that I was probably not going back to the Brattle Bookshop, which is a used bookstore here in Boston that I love, that I probably wasn't going back there for at least a solid month. I know I made a video just a little while ago saying that, <laughs> uh, but I had an errand to run first thing this morning. And you might say, well, so what? You can do your errands without going to the Brattle, but my errand was actually at the Brattle. <laughs> it was actually at the bookstore. And that still wouldn't have been enough, but a certain worshipful viewer of my channel, uh, who will remain nameless, I will give you only the vaguest of clues, uh, crusty, old, curmudgeon, small New England state. I'm afraid I can't get any more specific than that, so there's no chance you're ever going to guess the name of this person. But he said, go! <laughs> so, so I went. Uh, and I did my errand at the Brattle Bookshop, and then I shopped for myself. Business before pleasure. <laughs> and I got some books. I didn't get anywhere near as many books as last time. But I was only there a couple of days ago. Uh, but I found some, some neat things. Some things that I've actually wanted. And a couple of things that were more or less provoked uh, by BookTube. Uh, the first one is the only mass market paperback. And I had this once upon a time. Did you come out in the 80s? 1985. I had this once upon a time. This paperback has seen better days. It is... I will be careful with it because I really, really enjoyed it. This is Walter John Williams, who's an author that I think is fantastic. And this is his, his book, Night Moves, with this gorgeous cover, this original cover. Can you imagine how ugly that would look today? Uh, and the centaurs actually do feature in this book. They are the product of gene splicing. This takes place in a future world in which uh, a star drive has developed that allows humans to travel at light speed and therefore opened up you know, a huge section of the, the, their galaxy. But rumor has started to trickle in to the two main characters in the book that an alien species has been found that has instantaneous travel, that has developed instantaneous travel. Light speed is, as, as <laughs> nuclear physicists are fond of saying, to the consternation of their classrooms, light speed is fairly slow. <laughs> but uh, uh, that new discovery may change everything about human society. And it provokes some wonderful plot developments later on. This is one of the only science fiction novels that I love that where it's not the science fiction that's driving the love of it. It prompts some wonderful meditations about, well, what do we want to change and what don't we want to change? What, what, maybe not in what sense will we resist technology, but what's important to preserve against the, on, the unintended onslaught of technology? Another book, a later book than this, I believe, uh, that really did a good job with that, that I don't have a copy of. I'm hoping that I will encounter a mass market copy of it sometime in March, uh, is Stephen Barnes' novel, A Million Open Doors, which does the same thing. There is instantaneous transport there. So, But uh, I haven't read this since the mid-'80s, and I like Walter John Williams, so I will definitely I will definitely give it a try. Uh, we'll give it a, I'll give it a reread. Then this next one is... Uh, this was a series of things. We actually saw a few of these in an earlier haul. I'm only assuming that this is from that same person, whoever had that originally, and that they're just coming up unevenly. But uh, this is fascinating. This is by L.A. and J.A. Hamey, and it is in the Cambridge Introduction to History series, and this is The Roman Engineers. They're longitudinal books, uh, and all paperback. Here you have... Uh, an illustration of an, an aqueduct going up. But then on the back, you have a photo of that aqueduct, which is taken 2,000 years later. And this has not only pictures and maps of all, uh, of all the things you might think, but also uh, charts and diagrams of how it worked, how the Romans actually did the incredible engineering feats that they did. So naturally, I had uh, there's a, a booktube event starting in March. Uh, there's no place like Rome. Uh, it's all all things Roman, and I saw this and grabbed it. Any I would have grabbed it anyway, but I was very happy to uh, to add it here. Then this next one. Uh, this next one is a, a two-fisted Steve type book. It's about Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. 
So I make it a seed book right there. Longfellow doesn't have many fans, but I'm one of them. Uh, and it was written by... It was written by a dear, wonderful man. Just a, a wonderful, utterly bookish man. Just a, someone who could have looked at a laptop camera, if he could ever imagine such a thing, and said what I say every week, which is that my whole life, his whole life, was devoted to books. And for a long time. Although he was pretty fond of a wonderful meal with friends out of the endless, endless, gorgeous beauty of an Iowa afternoon, of an Iowa twilight. Any of you don't, you won't know what I'm talking about. Maybe you will if you live in, in the south of England. But any of you from Iowa will know what I mean. Iowa in high summer is as close as the world gets to paradise. Hence the, the knowing smiles when uh, the character in Field of Dreams says, is this Iowa? Is this heaven? And the character responds, no, this is Iowa. And the character finally en ends up with a response that says, could have sworn it was heaven. Uh, don't mind me. <laughs> I, don't, I know that Iowa right now is lost in fentanyl, it's lost in opioids, and also it's lost in fascism. But the people, the ordinary people, uh, and the places... <laughs> but anyway, anyway, I finally have one of his books. I don't have any of them, and the book that I really want most was never made. Uh, the person is Harry Hansen, and this book is Longfellow's New England. We have the schmutz. That is not the brattle. There's the schmutz of an old price tag on there. I'll get that off. So it's just a clear blue sky. This takes you through all the places of Longfellow, and fun it has all pictures of all of those places, but it functions as a biography of Longfellow. I just realized uh, that this might have a picture of the author. This book might have a picture of the author. No, it doesn't. Okay. Actually, I'm happy about that. Okay. Uh, all right. It doesn't have a picture of the author. That would be a little bit of a gut punch. Uh, the, the book that I really want by this author is a big book of his collected book reviews, which, as far as I know, has never been done. And no one has any interest in doing it. I'm sure that his papers are collected because he was a, a major figure in the literary world for a long time. You don't know his name, but he was. I'm sure that his papers are collected somewhere. Maybe not his correspondence, but who would even bother to go looking for it? What a life story you could do. If you wrote Harry's life, what a life story it would be. All bookish, entirely bookish. So, you know, if you're a mirror sunglasses bean counter at a publisher, you might say, well, that's not going to do any good. But every bookish person would buy it. Every bookish person would want to read it, especially if it could be interlaced with his letters. God knows how many of his letters were wrapped up or put in boxes, put in an attic, and then the house burned down or was sold. Ugh, I just hate it. I hate to think of it. How many legacies like this are gone. But I at least now have one of his books, and I, it's going to be a joy. I don't think I've read Longfellow's New England. Or if I did, it was a long time ago. Um, then uh, this is a repeat. We've seen this author before and also this subject before. Uh, this is uh, David Herbert Donald. And this is his, uh, one of his two biographies of Charles Sumner. This is Charles Sumner coming of the Civil War in a trade paperback. I had this trade paperback. I've had it many, many times throughout my life. I always managed to give it away. The last one that I had, I reinforced it with duct tape and all because it was in pretty rough shape. It didn't look like it would take a strong reading of mine, an annotating reading of mine, even with the duct tape. But I figured, you know, that'll do, and the brattle will provide. Sooner or later, I'll see another copy. Well, here's that other copy. But believe it or not, that duct tape copy, that masking tape copy, I actually sent to one of you. And I was, I took pictures of it ahead of time. I was, I was elaborately precautionary, saying, well, okay, but this is what it looks like. You really don't want this. It's not in very good condition. And they said, no, we'll take it. We'll absolutely take it. We don't have any books anywhere in Iran. It'd be fun to know that it came from you. Uh, so I, I have the other Sumner book, Charles Sumner and the Rights of Man. This is, this is the other Charles Sumner book. They were put together in one big trade paperback once upon a time, like 30 years ago. I have not seen that trade paperback in the wild ever, just ever. So I get this whenever I can. I'll hold on to it and, uh, and it'll be a joy to reread it. Uh, then this next one, this next one is sort of an ongoing joke at this point on this channel. Uh, a joke that's been going on forever and ever, a joke that's been going on longer than I've had this channel, longer than there's been a YouTube, is my weird relationship with the author Charles Dickens. 
I really, really like his nonfiction. I love his travel writing. I love his books, his, his writing about books. But aside from A Christmas Carol and maybe A Tale of Two Cities, I have never liked his novels. They just don't do anything for me. They, they, they have always struck me as just uh, an adolescent mugging for a camera. Look at me, Ma. Look at this. Isn't this clever? I know that the Dickensian fans out there are going nuts right now. And I am not saying, this is not one of the times where I'm saying that this critical judgment of mine is correct. And non-gainsayable. Of course, I'm, I have no qualms about saying that. When I have assessed an author from, from stem to stern and I feel like I know them, I'm okay with making that kind of a, a declaration. But Dickens is a lot like... What's another example? Uh, well, Proust would be a good example. Dickens is a lot like Proust in that I have, my mind has never felt that way. I have, I've always thought, and I still think, that when it comes to the big, beloved novels, it must be me. And not Dickens. But in the meantime, the dichotomy of that relationship has stayed true. <laughs> I still love reading about Charles Dickens. Anything about it. Much more than I like reading him. <laughs> and I found a really good marriage of the two. I would have gotten this anyway, uh, because I love this whole series. This is by Nori Epstein, and this is The Friendly Dickens. <laughs> uh, which, will, which will have excerpts from Dickens' work. Yes, it's full of excerpts, but it has lots... This whole series has lots of other things, too. It will have all sorts of other considerations, metatextual considerations, uh, all these insets and everything. It's very much, they do one of these for Jane Austen. They do one for the universe. The, I, I wanted to find the friendly Dickens. This will just go on my increasingly large shelf of Dickensiana. <laughs> I must be building a, the biggest library in the world of Dickensiana, that is owned by someone who doesn't really like the novels. The guy, this is the reason this guy's a success. I'm going to give this a try. I'm going to pop a bookmark in it and give this a try. This is one of the shorter of the friendly. There, I think there are only four friendly books. Uh, the friendly Jane Austen is, is wonderful. Uh, the, oh no, there's a friendly Shakespeare. I think that I don't think I've ever seen or that I don't have at the moment. Do I? Do I have the friendly Shakespeare bean? You don't care. <laughs> she doesn't care about books. <laughs> it's a market personality defect. <laughs> We had such a we had such a tense moment on one of our walks today. It's a beautiful, bright, sunny day, so we've been out a lot. And I've said many times before, I know what Frida looks like. She looks like exactly the kind of tense little dog who will do nothing until your big happy dog gets near, and then she'll just launch herself, psychotically attack your dog, or attack you if you get too close. I know that she looks exactly like that. She also acts exactly like that. Because when she sees another dog at a distance, she freezes with homicidal intent. <laughs> and I always tell other dog owners, you know, it's not going to offend me if you want to keep your dog away. I'm telling you, that appearance is deceiving. She is not at all aggressive. She is not going to bite your dog, even if your dog bit her. It would, if there were any chance of a problem, I wouldn't let it come anywhere near to happening. She just looks that way. She's not actually that way. And I, one owner we met today was walking a little dog, just a little bit bigger than Frida. The dog so much wanted to meet Frida. It was breaking my heart. And the owner was a little bit skeptical. And I, I, I told her, you don't have to believe me. It's all right. And she said, well, you know, I don't think you'd say that if, you weren't, if it wasn't true. So she just marched her dog right up. And it was perfectly fine. Frida's not... She's not going to make friends with another dog. She wants them to stand still, like a science exhibit, so that she can sniff all the interesting parts, and then they're free to go. <laughs> but what's this you want to do? Uh, checks notes. Play? <laughs> no, I don't want to play. What, what, do you, what do you think I am? No, I don't want to play. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm glad I found this, and I am. it is uh, the... Uh, most likely candidate for the thing, the book from the Brattle Hall that uh, goes onto the reading list for tonight. This is the most, I'm just going to read, I think I'm just going to read the whole of this tonight. So not just the meta parts, but also whatever fiction is in here. What what fiction is actually in here? Uh, will this tell me? It helps you turn the page of the masterpieces like David Copperfield or Nicholas Nickleby. Okay, but is there like a, a long, uh, a long bit of Dickens, or is this all about Dickens? Biography, more biography. An excerpt from all excerpt from Oliver Twist from the Pickwick Papers. Oh, excerpts from all of the books. Uh, surely the Christmas Carol is in here un, unedited. No. 
no. Wow. All right. This doesn't appear to have any un unedited tickets. But that's okay. Maybe that's what I need. <laughs> Maybe that's what I need. But I, I think I ignored this when it first came out. This came out in what, the 80s? Uh, 1998. I think I ignored it. Because I think at the time, all I was thinking about is, you know, Dickens and I just don't get along, so what would be the point? Uh, well, I'm not going to ignore it this time. And then we'll finish up. See, it was a, it was a smaller Brattle Hall. Uh, I dealt with a lot more books than this, but they didn't come home with me. Uh, we'll finish up with military history. I found two big works of military history. The first is by Gordon Corrigan, and I don't think... Is that, is that are those clouds in the sky? Or is that dirt on the book? I think this is a UK edition. I don't know that this ever had an American pub publication. This is the Second World War, a military history. Nice hefty thing here that all the blurbs on the back, rather telltale, are from UK sources. So this, if if this had an American edition, it might not have looked like this. I don't think I've ever read this. And the Second World War is the greatest war in American history. It's one of the greatest subjects in human history. I want to read it, definitely. Uh, so I, on the chance that I didn't know it or that maybe it was repackaged as something else, I grabbed it. And then this last thing, it was just sitting out there in the dollar lot. Uh, but it came up recently in a Steve stream or a Q&A or somewhere. Donald Kagan came up. The historian Donald Kagan came up. Uh, and I said at the time that, you know, he seems so much on paper like a historian that I should like. And yet, and yet it's never really done it for me. And I was, I, I was happy to hear, either in the Steve stream or a Q&A, that the person who was bringing him up was having the same kind of reaction. This, this looks on paper like something I should love, but I'm not loving it. I'm not hating it, but I'm not loving it. So I found his his big magisterial thing, of course, not big in terms of size. He wrote a multi-volume history of the Peloponnesian War that is big in size. I don't think anything could induce me to read that whole thing again. Uh, but this is a big one-volume book on the origins of war, where he looks at a few different wars. World War One, I, I think. World War Two is in here. The Pun Second Punic War. Uh, he also looks at the Cuban Missile Crisis, which is not a war, but but could have been. Came right at the edge of being the last war, ever. Uh, and, uh, I when when did you come out? I I read this when it first came out. Uh, when was that? Uh, Nineteen ninety five. I read this on or about 1995, maybe 96, something like that. I don't think I was... I, I wasn't in the reviewing game at the time, but I read it, uh, probably out of a library, and just thought it was just the same thing as that poster about Donald Kagan said. It, just, it isn't bad, but it never thrilled me, not for a minute. I've read a lot of books on the origins of war. This is Here he looks at a series of wars and also one non-war to try and analyze the factors that caused it to happen. And I, uh, it's been a long time. 1995, what is that? That's 30 years. So I'm going to give this another try. It came up and then I saw it there on the shelf, you know, with a plastic covering on it and everything. I thought, that that's somebody nudging you. That's the book gods nudging you. Don't ignore that or you'll never find anything. Uh, so I grabbed it and I will read it. But although I think the friendly Dickens gets the nod for tonight. Maybe this will. Lately, the reading that I have been planning to do has been badly slipping out of my control. Not in any bad way. There's no real way for that to be bad. But uh, lately I have been saying, all right, well, it's going to be you, you, and you, but definitely not you. And then the definitely not ends up commanding my attention. So it could be that, that I grapple with this all night long. Uh, but that, that's what I got today. A fairly controlled Brattle Hall. And the last one for a good long time. Uh, <laughs> unless I have another errand to run there. Well, will that work? <laughs> so, besides, this is a command performance from a person who shall remain nameless. Uh, anyway, <laughs> this is, we have uh, all the origins of war. We have the Second World War, and specifically military history. We have the Friendly Dickens, which is not any, unlike other items in the Friendly series, this doesn't have anything unabridged. This is just selections from Dickens. Um, what else do we have here? Oh, yes. Uh, Longfellow's New England. Uh, that's going to be wonderful to do. We have the Roman engineers, heavily illustrated. We have uh, Charles Sumner and the coming of the Civil War. And we have uh, Night Moves, 
by Walter John Williams, which is it's it's cocked and it's yellowed, and uh, the, you can see here the that crease right there. This cover is about ready to come off the book, so I'm going to have to. It's not going to be pretty, but I'm going to have to just tape this up to to make sure that it can take a reread. I at least want to reread it uh, for a dollar. I at least want to reread it. So there you go. That was a Brattle Hall for a sunny Friday. Don't expect another Brattle Hall tomorrow because <laughs> you're not going to get one. You're not going to get a Brattle Hall for a good 10 days, two weeks. Uh, so just make your peace with that. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to wrap this up for now, uh, but I'll be back. <laughs> Thank you, Booktube.